your Bible this evening, if you would please, to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts 17, please. For our scripture reading tonight. We're going to read verses 1 through 12 of Acts 17. Reading the verses responsibly as we normally do. Beginning together on verse 1 and then... We'll read verse two. I'll read verse two and together on three and alternating like that till we end on verse number 12. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse one of Acts chapter 17. Ready? Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few." But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren into the rulers, unto the rulers of the cities, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. <coughs> and they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason, and of the other they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Let's read 12 together also. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. And now let's pray. <clears throat> Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for not only inspiring your word and giving it to men of old as they wrote down what you instructed them to write, but per for preserving it for us that we can hold copies of your word tonight. Lord, we believe the word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we believe that it can divide asunder between the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. That it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. And so, Lord, may each of us be open to your word this evening. May you honor the preaching and the teaching of it tonight. Bless the special now in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I really wasn't one for going to church, you see. But I went that night somehow in spite of that. They ushered me in with a warm and friendly smile. And five rows back I sat. Five rows back. I remember it well, the story of Jesus I heard them tell. They told about heaven and one of hell. I listened from five rows back. 
The words of the preacher man were errors of burning truth. They raised my heart as he spoke so earnestly. He told how Jesus suffered, how he bled and he died, and he did it just for sinners like me. Soon the choir was singing, just as I am, I knew I was lost, my life was a sham. I came and I was washed in the blood of the Lamb. From five rows back I came. Oh, what a change. Things are different now. Peace and happiness filled my heart. Jesus walks and talks with me each passing day. And I know that through the years of time and through eternity, I'll not forget that night my sins were washed away. Oh, the choir was singing, just as I am. I knew I was lost and my life was a sham. I came and was washed in the blood of the Lamb. From five rows back I came. Oh, from five rows back I came. Amen. Well, as they say, if that doesn't bless you, your blesser's busted. But uh, that's good. Thank you, Bob. Father, thank you for this evening now. And Lord, we ask for your help as we open up your word. And we want to hear from you this evening. Lord, has been stated tonight, it has pleased you through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And Lord, we believe that not only is the preaching able to save those that are lost, it's able to save those that believe as well. And Lord, I pray you'll use the message tonight to have a passion in our heart that we each of us would desire to be a Berean Christian, and therefore we would have a Berean church. And so Lord, help us and speak to every heart tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Some of you of, a, of my generation will remember a radio commentator by the name of Paul Harvey. Uh, it was pretty much a standard thing for many, many years of my life to hear him come on at noon and do his 15-minute broadcast. And he always ended that broadcast with, for what it's worth, and then it would be a story. And one day he had this story on for what it's worth, <clears> he <throat> said, for what it's worth, our department hears from Hershey, Pennsylvania, where the woman in the Mercedes had been waiting patiently for a parking place to open up. The shopping mall was crowded, and the woman in the Mercedes had zigzagged between rows, when up ahead she saw a man with a load of packages heading to his car. So she drove up, parked behind him, and waited while he opened his trunk and loaded it with packages. Finally, he got in his car and he was backing it out of the stall. But before the woman in the Mercedes could pull her car in, a young man in a shiny new Corvette zipped past and pulled into the empty space. Got out and started walking away. She put her window down and said, Hey, I've been waiting for that parking space. The college-age driver said, Sorry, lady. That's how it is when you're young and quick. At that instant, she put her Mercedes in gear and floorboarded it, crashing into and crushing the right rear fender and corner panel of the flashy new Corvette. Now the young man's jumping up and down and screaming, You can't do that! And the lady in the Mercedes said, that's how it is when you're old and rich. 
As I thought about that story, I realized that, you know, maturity doesn't necessarily come with age. <laughs> okay? You can be young and foolish, but I know you can be old and foolish too. There's certainly times, no matter what your age, that you've come to an end of a day and you thought about something you did that day and thought, how could I do that? What was I thinking? And uh, age doesn't always equal maturity. And when you read the passage we read this evening here about uh, not only in Thessalonica, but then the apostles going to Berea, the Bereans were the people that showed some spiritual maturity. And their character is marked by excellence. Paul, Paul described them as noble. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They were eager to hear the truth. They didn't oppose Paul. In fact, <clears throat> you have three groups of people in Acts 17 that the gospel goes to. You have them in Thessalonica at first, and they're met with some resistance. Now, folks got saved, for sure, but you know, they, they, the, the ones who didn't believe really stirred up the people, and eventually they had to get Paul and Silas out of there uh, at, at the risk of their life. And so they resisted the truth. You go to Berea, and in Berea, they received the Word. They, 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 they searched the Scriptures, and they received what Paul and Silas brought to them. Then... Paul goes to Athens, and that takes up the last part of chapter 17, Mars Hill and places like that, and there they ridiculed what he had to say. I don't want to resist the Word of God, and I don't want to ridicule the Word of God. I want to receive the Word of God. I want to be Berea. I want to be a Berean Christian, and we're going to look at them this evening, all right? So take your Bible there and look at Acts 17. And <clears throat> notice, first of all, with me, they received the word. Verse 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so or those things were so. So when it says they were more noble, it's referring to their character. It's referring, originally, the word noble meant well born or spoke of being born of nobility or royalty. But later it became just simply to mean people of a generous spirit who are open-minded towards truth and it would give somebody a fair hearing. In other words, they were more noble because they listened. They were more noble because they were open to the preaching of the gospel and they were listening with an open heart to the truth. As we sat around that uh, conference room uh, Wednesday, uh, down at the State House and listened to one man. He was sharing his testimony just with those of us who were going to testify. We hadn't been before the committee yet. And he was relating how he'd been an atheist. And he actually, what, what his journey began is he began to, and, and by the way, he, he finally went to church because a friend kept inviting him to come. Okay, How many people went to church because a friend kept inviting you to go? Don't, don't, don't lose track of that. Okay? Don't let a rejection or two stop you. Keep on asking. Keep on inviting. And finally he went and he, he told the church, it wasn't a large church, and he told them, he said, I'm not a believer. I'm an, in fact, I consider myself an atheist, but he said this. He said, I am open. I am willing to listen. And I'm willing to learn. And over the course of a couple years, though that church loved him and helped him and, and worked with him until he came to where he put his faith in Jesus Christ as his Savior. And so he was noble because he was least open to the message. You notice the Bible says here, they received the word with all readiness of mind. There was an anticipation, an anticipation, an expectancy that God would speak to them. I think Dean alluded to that in his testimony, that when you, when you come, you know what? I'm coming expecting God to speak to me. I mean, God to minister to me through His Word. And, and, and God does that. And you know what? You usually, usually get what you expect. And so you come expecting for God. I'm ready for God to speak to me. I'm ready and, and desiring for Him uh, to speak to me through His Word. And that put Him a cut above the people in Thessalonica who weren't ready to receive the Word. 
Did you come tonight to church expecting for God to speak to you? Expecting to hear from Him? Or did you just come out of merely a habit or giving little thought as to what you're going to do? We just go do our church thing and then we'll go home and see what's on television? You see, we can so easily fall into just ritual and habit and not say, Lord, this is a church service. This is, this is your word. This is the only book you've ever written. Speak to me tonight. And let me hear something from you as we go through the Word of God. It's a, it's a readiness of mine. It's an eagerness of mine. It's, it's eager to hear what God wants to say to us. And, and we want to be able to have... Jesus oftentimes when He spoke said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Every time we come to church, we ought to say, Lord, give me ears to hear what you want to say to me today. And every service He'll speak to your heart but you have to have ears to hear it and ask God to do that. That's a readiness. That's a readiness. Now, when you receive the Word with readiness or with eagerness, here's the thing. You generally, if that's going to be true, you're going to be reading the Bible. If you're a stranger to the Bible, if Sunday morning comes and you're saying, anybody seen my Bible? Anybody know? Hey, where's my Bible? Have you seen it? I don't remember where I laid it last Sunday. See, then probably you're not going to be real eager and ready for God to speak to you when the Word of God is preached. It comes from reading the Word of God. The sad truth is there's many, many Christians that don't read God's Word. I wish that weren't true. That's, that's a painful thing to say. And it should not be that way. But less, less than 50%, according to a Barna research group, Less than 50% of American Christians open their Bible in a given week. 82% of believers think that God helps those who help themselves is directly from the Bible. Can I help you? That's not in the Bible. Okay? So don't, don't get confused. God helps those who ask Him for help. That's who God helps, okay? Realize they need help. 63% could not name the four Gospels. 52% did not know the book of Jonah is in the Bible. It's just, it's just an amazing, amazing thing. Are you ready to receive His Word when you come to church? You know, I'm amazed so many times as Christians... If you're not reading the Bible and you're not understanding the Bible, it's amazing how many Christians we can talk about the weather, politics, sports, entertainment, restaurants, food, clothes. But boy, somebody starts talking about the Bible and we clam up or change the subject because we're so unfamiliar with the contents. My friend, there's only one thing to do about that. That's not, not talk about the Bible. Read the Bible. Amen. Begin to learn what it says. They were ready to receive God's Word. They received the Word of God. Then secondly, notice what else they did. They didn't just receive it. It says, they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily. They searched the Word. They searched the Word. They were of a ready mind, and we talked about that, but here they searched the Scriptures daily. Why? They were not going to be content with the words of a man. And, and by the way, this man was the Apostle Paul. <laughs> if, if you would have taken anybody's word for it, you might have taken his. But they didn't take his. And by the way, Paul didn't, Paul didn't scold them for that. He commended them for that. And so did God commended them to make sure. They wanted a thus saith the Lord. What does God say? And so they searched the Scriptures daily as to whether to see those things that are being taught were true or not. Listen, I, I don't have any problem at all. There's times when I've had uh, different ones here come up to me after I've preached something or taught something and say, hey, you know what? Uh, have you thought about this Scripture over here or this Scripture over here? And they're, they're in a nice way pointing out I'm not sure that was completely accurate what you said. And you know what? That's good. Number one, they're listening. 
And number two, they know the scriptures. And they're searching the scriptures to make sure those things are so. And, and I want to make sure that what I teach is correct and right according to the Bible. And so uh, that's, that's the way these Berean people were. And they, they searched the scriptures. They received Paul's preaching. They listened to it. And then they, they searched the scriptures. How often does it say? Daily. Daily. Daily they searched God's Word and studied God's Word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. They were the, the Bereans were the blessed man of Psalm 1. They walked not in the counsel of ungodly, they stood not in the way of sinners, they sat not in the seat of the scornful, they delighted in the law of the Lord, and in His law did they meditate day and night. They poured over the Bible, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Evaluating the word they heard from the Apostle Paul. And, and that's, a, that's exactly what each of us should do. Make sure that it's according to God's word. It's like Brother Gary was sharing with me when he heard the fellow on the radio say that you know, it was Satan that killed Jesus. Right away, in his spirit, he said, that's something not right. That doesn't sound right. And he said, you know, have I not been in church faithfully and heard the teaching of the Word of God faithfully, I might not be able to discern that. And that's true. And so you search the Scriptures to make sure it's true. Don't, just because somebody says it, don't swallow it. Make sure that it backs up with Scripture. The authority, the authority is not the pastor's Word. The authority is God's Word. And if the God, what I say carries authority as long as it's what God says. And that's what carries the authority. And by the way, this is a strong statement for what Baptists believe, which is one of the uh, fundamentals of Baptist belief, and that is the priesthood of the believer. So what is the priesthood of the believer? It's that each one of us has equal access to God. Though I'm the pastor of Bible Baptist Church, I do not have more access to God than you do. Okay? Uh, we, we, we all are equal when it comes to accessing our Father. Okay? We're all believers, and when as a believer, you have access to God. And you have access to the Holy Spirit of God. And so when you study the Scriptures and you, you delve into the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit of God can speak to you just like He speaks to the pastor. He can teach you the Word of God just like He teaches the pastor the Word of God. But you have to study to show yourself approved unto God. And the Holy Spirit will be your teacher. And they could search the Scriptures and they could hear directly from God through His Word. You don't need a theologian or some member of the clergy to interpret God's Word for you. You have the Holy Spirit of God. Before you sit down to read the Bible, before you sit down to study the Bible, have you ever just taken a moment and asked the Holy Spirit to teach you while you read and study? He's there to help you. He's, there. He's the one who's going to teach you and guide you into all truth. Ask Him to help you. And He will help you. And, and, and be willing to follow what the Bible says. And that brings us to the third point tonight. They received the Word, they searched the Word, and then they were transformed by the Word of God. Verse 12 says, Therefore, because they received the readiness of mind, because they searched the Scriptures daily, many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Their lives became transformed. They were transformed because that's what God's Word does. It transforms us. As we believe it and respond to the truth of God, the God's Word changes us. We hear the Word of God and we study the Word of God so we can live the Word of God. You don't just hear it and study it so you can know it. You do it so you can live it. So many people want to hear from God and then decide whether they're going to obey God. That's not how God works. Once you know what God says, you're to obey God and do whatever it is that He tells you to do. That's why Jesus said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And we have to be willing to do what God would want us to do. You know, if you know, if you know what God wants you to do and you're resisting it, then the Bible says that's sin. 
For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. So somebody said, well, I know what God wants me to do. I'm just not sure I want to do it. It's like saying, well, I know I shouldn't sin, but I just want to. You see? When you, when you say that, you think, well, that's crazy. Who would want to do that? But that's what we're doing if we disobey God. That's what God's Word says. And it's not a matter of, most of the time, God's will isn't hard to figure out. You know what's hard? Whether we'll get our will out of the way and do God's will. That's the challenge. Will our will, will we get that will out of the way so we can do God's will? Are you willing to do God's will when He reveals it to you? Do you receive God's Word like the Bereans did? With an open heart and an open mind? Ready to study it and search it? Because you have a high regard for the truth of God? And the truth transforms my life. As I study it and I meditate on the Word of God, it begins to transform me as I obey Him. Now, the key is this. We get the Bible into our, into our mind, into our head. But head knowledge of the Bible doesn't transform you. It has to get into your heart. And not that thing beaten, but it has to get into the core of your being. Who you are. And once it gets from your head into your heart, it'll come out in your life. Okay? And, and that's what it's intended to do. Uh, guard your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. It's the, 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 the things how you live. And so we've got to get the Word. Thy Word have I hid where? In my heart. Not my mind. In my heart. That I might not sin against God. And so we want to get it. It's the, text, the Bible isn't a textbook to be studied. It's what God uses to change our heart and life. It's like any other book you have. You can read other books and get information, but you read the Bible and you'll get transformation. <clears throat> so first, I'm not saying you don't get it into your head. You've got to start there. Okay? You, he, notice it said Paul reasoned with them three Sabbath days out of the Scriptures. And so they're reasoning, they're using their brain. Okay? And they're reasoning. And so the, the best way to get it into your head is to read the Bible every day. You'd be surprised, you know, we, we talk about when, when you read the Bible enough times and you read passages enough times, you'd be amazed how much you start remembering. Over and over and over again. Read, how many of you read Proverbs every day? Do you read a proverb every day? How many folks do that? How many have been doing it for quite a while now? Okay, yeah, Amazing how many times you'll remember a proverb. Oh, you may not know exactly the chapter and the verse it is, but you'll remember that proverb almost committed to memory. You didn't set out to say, I'm going to memorize that. But you've read it every day for the last 12 months or 24 months or 36 months. And you read something 36 times, you're generally going to remember it. And so you get it into your head. But you have to, you have to continue to read the Word of God. George Mueller, the great man of faith, read his Bible through 200 times in his life. So a regular reading of the Bible. The other thing you can do is you commit yourself to being faithful to church. You'd be surprised how much Bible you'll learn, how much Bible you'll pick up by being faithful to Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. You'd be amazed at the amount of Bible you'll get. Think about the Bible verses you'll hear and the Bible verses you'll, you'll learn by, by being committed to the church of God. All right? So that's getting it into our head. Now, we have to get it from our head into our heart. Okay? Now that... That's the challenge that each of us has, to get the Word of God into our heart. One of the ways you can do that is to write down things while you're reading the Bible. You call that journaling or whatever you want to call it, note-taking, whatever you want to call that, but you ought to write down. You know what it is? See, a relationship with God isn't just a monologue. That's not a relationship. A relationship is a dialogue. God talks to me. And how does God talk to us? Through His Word. And then we talk to God. 
And so as God talks to me and God speaks to me, I, I want to write down what God says to me. You ever, you ever hear something and think, boy, that's really good, and you didn't write it down? And then later on, you thought, boy, what was that I heard that I thought was so good I'd never forget it? Hmm? And now you can't remember it. Why? Because you didn't take time to write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Uh, write down what God talks to you. That helps to get it from your head and get into your heart and once it gets into your heart, you're going to live what you learn. You're going to live what you learn. It's when God tells you to do something, then, then already, listen, just determine I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Whatever the Word says, whatever I'm writing down, whatever God's speaking to my heart about, that's what I will do. I will obey. I'm not going to just read the Bible to say, okay, I read the Bible. No, I'm reading the Bible for me to obey the Bible. James put it what way? Be ye doers of the Word, not hearers only. I'm not just going to be a hearer of the Word of God. I want to be the doer of the Word of God. I want to live out the Bible. Somebody said God loves us just the way we are, but He refuses to leave us that way. Okay? Why? What is God... What is God trying to get us to? Where is God trying to move us to? To be like Jesus. It's like exactly right. He's not expecting you to be like Jesus when you get saved. No, we talked about that this morning. Uh, it was scarcely for a righteous man would somebody die, and peradventure for a good man some may dare to die. But God committed His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See? And so we're, he takes us from that state and he doesn't leave us there. He begins to work in us and through us. It's God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And he begins to work in us. But how does God work in us? We have to allow his word to come into us. If we don't allow the word to come into us, we're shutting off the process of sanctification. Jesus prayed in John 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? That's what sanctifies us and sets us apart. God uses His Word. You know, if, if truth hasn't transformed your life, then it's not the, the problem isn't on the truth side. The problem's on our side. We've shut that off. Because the Word of God will transform you if you allow it to. You have to be willing to do His will. You know, it, some of these guys who go to prison will attest to this. You know, there's times we run into some guys at prison who, I'm telling you, will know the Bible as well as any of us and quote scriptures as good as any of us could quote scripture. I mean, they, they got all the answers and yet he's on his seventh number. His life's a mess. You think, man, how can you know all this Bible and know all this scripture and it not get through to your life and not make a difference because it's all stored in his head and it never got into his heart. And he hasn't lived out the Bible that he knows. And so his life is a disaster. He, you have to let the Word of God be transforming and you do that by obedience. Doing what God tells you to do. When there's... When there's no application of the truth, you might as well believe a lie. Apply the truth to your life. This church believes the Bible's the Word of God. That's why we give it a high priority in our church. And we place a great emphasis on that. That's why the Bible has a high position at Bible Baptist Church. It's in our name. Bible Baptist Church. I'm glad that they put it in that order. Because the most important part of that, that is Bible Baptist Church. Somebody says, why are you a Baptist? I'm a Baptist because I believe right now, for years now, the independent Baptists have held as close to that book as I know anybody does. Now, if that day changes, then I wouldn't be a Baptist. I'll be something else. But, but I'm going to be loyal to the Bible, the, the Word of God. Every time you come Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we're going to open up the Bible. The Bible is what transforms us. It's what changes us. 
That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have Wednesday night Bible study. We have Wednesday night children's clubs and why we have the youth ministry and why we have a Christian growth class and why we have a Reformers Unanimous, an RU program. That's why we have an RU inside at the prison. It's, 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 it's the Word of God and it transforms our lives. So, we want to be ready to receive the Word when we come to church. We want to be uh, searching the Scriptures daily. It's not enough to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Tomorrow morning when your alarm goes off, you need to get up and grab your Bible. And before you head off for work, before you go out to see other people, you need to read God's Word. With a notebook or paper and a pen, listening for God to speak to you. And saying, God, I want to listen for something today that I can live today. I can obey today. I want don't just want the word in my head. I want it in my heart. So I can live it in my life. Transform me through your word. So the, the word is not just there for information. In fact, the Bible says, knowledge puffeth up. Okay? Charity edifies. So I just don't want to get puffed up with knowledge. I want to live the Bible. God never blessed, blessed anybody for the Bible they knew. He blessed them for the Bible they lived. And so we're accountable for that. So let's be, hey, let's be a Berean Christian. Better yet, that'll make us a Berean church. And it's the Word of God that'll change people's lives. And it'll change your life if you'll let it. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, <clears throat> take the truth this evening. Thank you for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you for the Bereans. Thank you, Lord, that sandwiched in between the Thessalonian resistance that they had and the Athens ridicule that they experienced, they met a group of people that were ready to receive your word and search the scriptures and then were transformed by the scriptures. That's who I want to be. Lord, don't allow us, help us not to resist your word. Please help us not to ridicule your word. Help us to receive it with all readiness of mind. I pray, Lord, that on a Monday morning you'd see every member of Bible Baptist Church with an open Bible somewhere. I'm asking you to speak to their heart. Searching the Scriptures ready for you to speak to them, that we might obey what you've told us to do. But Lord, we want our lives to be changed. We want our lives to be transformed. That we might be like Christ. Accomplish that work in each one of us. Forgive us for falling short of that. Help us to be a Berean Christian. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Are you a Berean Christian tonight? Do you have a, a steady time in the Word of God where you read God's Word? Do you write down what God says to you? Will you, will you search the Scriptures with the intent that you want to obey the Scriptures? that I really do want to live what you show me, God? Because I really do want you to change my life. I really don't. You know, it's easy for the guys in prison to say, yeah, I want God to change my life. Look where I am. But it's quite different when we're not in prison, at least physically, to say, God, change me. Make me into the vessel you want me to be. I wonder how many folks here tonight would just say, Preacher, the Spirit of God has spoken to my heart. I really want to be a Berean Christian. And by God's help, I'm going to begin to read my Bible and search the Scriptures with the intent of obeying them and living them out of my life and watch God transform me into the person, into the Christian He desires me to be. Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart tonight. Pray for me. Will you slip it up, Christian? Say, pray for me, Pastor. 
Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Oh, what the world's looking for is some Berean Christians. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless this invitation time now. Thank you for ministering to our hearts tonight. Lord, give us that hunger and thirst for righteousness. We will hunger and thirst after your word. That we might not only read it, but meditate in it. That we might observe to do according to all that's written therein. So then our way will be prosperous and then we'll have good success in your sight. Bless this invitation to that end, please. And I'll thank you for it.